Welcome to the Mindful Healers Podcast with Dr. Jesse Mahoney and Dr. Ni Cheng Lang. We are here to help you learn to pause and be present, awaken your breath, and harness the ripple effects of mindfulness for radiant health. We get you. We know you. We are you. We have both been successful on the surface, yet struggling underneath. We have both had cluttered brains, been overwhelmed, and exhausted. We are healers who have found solutions and want to share them with you. Join us here to discover a better way. So, welcome to the Mindful Healers podcast. Today, we have a special episode with Dr. Shauna Shapiro. In this podcast, we are going to explore the practice of Good Morning, I Love You, a healing and growth practice for adults and children. And I am so excited to have uh, Dr. Shapiro on. She wrote one of my favorite books, and I personally apparently have purchased 110 copies of it to share with people that I work with. And the reason that I love this book is it's the accessibility of mindfulness and compassion. And I find that the way the lens that she brings to it is really powerful and helpful, especially for people in healthcare. And so we'll talk a bit about that and also about her new book that's coming out in a few days called Good Morning, I Love You, Violet. And as many of our listeners know, I'm a pediatrician. And so the thought of being able to share these tools with children at the outset of their lives when they're learning rather than with adults who are unlearning some of the unhelpful practices is very exciting to me. So at the outset, I thought I would just share um, a little bit about Dr. Shapiro, and this is actually from my book, uh, to share who she is and where she's from, for those of you who don't know her. She is a clinical psychologist and an internationally recognized expert in mindfulness and self-compassion. She has spent two decades studying the benefits of mindfulness, publishing many papers, critically acclaimed books, and done a TEDx talk on the power of mindfulness. She's a professor at Santa Clara University and a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Jesse. I'm so delighted to be here. So as usual, we always start with um, what you, uh, our intention and what we hope you will discover and some takeaways. So my intention today is to have you all hear from Dr. Shapiro herself about these practices and a bit about the neuroscience of mindfulness and self-compassion. And I hope you will all discover why practicing mindfulness and self-compassion is important for both adults and children and teens. And what I'm hoping you will take away from our conversation is some of the more detailed information about how you can engage your neurochemistry and neuromodulators to help you and understanding the neurochemistry of intention itself. Mm. And that you might resonate with the idea of mindfulness as mental fitness. And then finally, the importance of these practices for children. So, I was wondering if as we start, um, perhaps we could just talk about, um, maybe we'll dive right into the neuromodulators and neurochemistry, which might seem like a crazy topic to start with. And yet when I work with people, it's one of the things that resonates most deeply. We all sort of know that mindfulness and self-compassion is important, but why is it important and how does it help you? And I, your explanations in this book of the science of it really helps people who have been unsure about it um, dive in and try it. So I would love to hear your take on it if you're willing to share. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I really appreciate that you started us off with intention because intention is really central to mindfulness and our intentions really set the stage for what is possible, right? They set the compass of our heart and our mind. And they say, this is what's important. This is the direction I want to head. And what's interesting about our intention is that it's not just some psychological or spiritual phenomena. It's actually neurochemical that when we set intentions, it releases a whole cascade of neurochemistry that supports us in reaching our goals. So I want to invite anyone that's listening right now to really actually take a moment and reflect on your intention. Maybe it's to learn, maybe it's to be present, 
Maybe it's for your own healing or to find greater peace and just finding your intention. And as you do this, what happens is it releases dopamine, the neuromodulator of motivation and learning. And as I said, sets in motion this cascade of neurochemistry that supports you, supports you in being present of, of really paying attention. So I love that you started with that. And as I said, intention is really the foundation of mindfulness because what intention does is it helps us zero in on what we want to pay attention to. And that's the second element of mindfulness is your attention, this ability to be present, to be actually here where you already are. And I think for many of us, for all of us, actually, that's difficult that we tend to spend our time in the future thinking about what am I going to do when this happens? Or we're lost in the past. If only I had done that, or if, you know, I wish I had done that. And we miss the present moment. And the present moment is actually the most important moment you have in this life. It's the only time you have to learn or to grow or connect. And so what I like to tell people is that attention is your most valuable resource and it can be trained. That's really what this practice of mindfulness does. I love that you brought up this idea of mental fitness. So what we're doing is we're training and stabilizing our attention in the present moment. Just like we can train our physical body to be flexible and strong and fit, we can train our mental health. We can train our mental fitness to be calm, flexible, fit. What's so interesting is you brought this up and I hadn't thought about it before, you know, physicians and people in healthcare, we train our mind forever, but mm -hmm. not in healthy ways. We train them to learn a lot of facts and memorize things. Um, and we even train our bodies to go without sleep and to go without bathroom privileges and to go without food to sort of get through a lot of what we do. And yet we often think of this mindfulness bit as sort of fluff. And yet mm. for people who have to perform at this sort of highest level um, where life and life is at stake often, really thinking about this idea of training both our mental fitness and our physical fitness, because we all know, and I think in healthcare, we know we need to exercise, but we don't think about this in the same way. And I think we also, taking it another step further, don't think about it for our patients either. Mm. It's such a great, great point. I mean, so many points you made, but the first is exactly as a physician, you want your mind clear. You want it flexible. You want to be able to think outside the box and creatively and find solutions. And you want your attention steady, right? That you can't listen to your patient. You can't hear everything they're saying. If your mind's wandering off, if you're thinking about your grocery list or who's next and all of us do that. In fact, the research shows our mind wanders on average 47% of the time. So that means that there's half of our life we're missing. And just like you said, these can be life and death moments. So I absolutely agree that it's essential for physicians to be trained in, you know, what I'm calling mental fitness. And then also for our patients, right? In fact, all of the patients that I work with, we train our minds. We train our minds to be able to better regulate our emotions. We train our minds to not always believe our stories. We train our minds so we can interrupt negative self-talk and learn to be on our own team. And, you know, as you said, we all agree physical fitness is good for us. No one would argue that. Whether or not you do it is one thing, but all of us agree, <laughs> right? But, but I think there's not as much attention paid to our mental fitness. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you also mentioned just what you pay attention to is your life. And I think as we think about, um, you know, physicians and what we pay attention to, there's so much energy right now and negative energy about mm -hmm. healthcare and how it's working and burnout and the problems. And I think for many of us who love what we do and we love the practice of medicine, this idea of attention and it being your most valuable, I think you said valuable asset, that is our opportunity there to put our attention on the things that we love about what we're practicing. And it doesn't mean that we're complacent and we're not going to fix anything, but it gets us out of all those negative neurochemicals so that we can start to be creative and think of solutions. 
Absolutely. And I really appreciate that you're bringing this up. So we as human beings have this tendency to look for the negative and to put our attention there. It's called the negativity bias. And evolutionarily, it makes sense, right? That we are descended from people who were cautious, who were always scanning their environments for danger. We are not descended from people who, when they heard wrestling in the bushes, were like, oh, let me pet the pretty kitty, right? They, they died. They were eaten by the tiger. So we we have this kind of proclivity toward negativity. And what you're saying is, is quite right, that we can intentionally choose to place our attention on the things we are grateful for, what we appreciate in medicine, what, what nourishes us. And this doesn't mean that we ignore the others. What it means is that we say, in addition to this challenge, what else is true? So that we're balancing it, right? I'm not saying ignore the negative. I'm saying put maybe 10% of your attention on the positive because right now it's 99%. I often say, can you give equal attention to the negative and the positive? Um, yes. And I would also, say, just, yes, you don't yes. even need equal. That's even asking too much of people. I, I heard just, you 5%. I was like, I just 5%. Equal. Right. And can you, you always just... say 1% better or 5% better having been on your retreat, which I think is really, really a helpful concept because most people in healthcare were perfectionists and exactly. were high achievers. And so we're like, well, I just have to, you know, stop all the negative talk right now. And my attention has to be fully focused on one thing or the other. And yet the invitation of 1% or 5% feels just so much less overwhelming. Exactly. And that's really the goal is that we're creating these new habits and it's not about perfect. It's about practice. Can I practice 5% more attention to the good each day? Can I practice 5% more compassion and kindness toward myself? Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to bring up is that as um, physicians, we are also specifically trained to look at the negative it, on mm -hmm. top of the proclivity to the negativity bias. <laughs> I'm a primary care pediatrician, right? We take healthy children and we stare at them and figure out what's wrong with them or one thing that can be fixed. And so, and it's necessary, you know, in ER docs and ICU docs and in the OR, you need to be looking for the negative. But then we need the ability to adapt and switch to look at neutral and look at positive in other settings. And for so yeah, many, it, it bleeds well, over. Go ahead. And I, and I do want to say, you know, looking for, you know, illness in someone or something that needs repair isn't exactly negative, right? What it is, is just being discerning. And I want to be really, really clear to people that, mindfulness is about discernment. It's about seeing things clearly. So when I'm identifying data or truth, that's not looking for the negative. What we're talking about here is really tending to focus only on what's what's wrong. And, and, and I think, of course, as physicians, we're looking for what's wrong in a person. And I think it's important to also emphasize what's right. But I just want to be really clear that, you know, even even negative emotions, right? They're still important and they are still, they're, they're messengers, right? They're important information. And so what mindfulness does is gives us this incredible ability to see all of it clearly. I love that. And I think this idea of discernment is the key piece in it mindfulness also slows us down enough. We work really hard and really fast and we don't slow down enough to be discerning. In fact, we are often reacting. And that I think is such mm. a beautiful invitation of mindfulness is to react less and discern more. Yes. And, and really to have these little spaces, these little gaps in between the trigger and our automatic reaction so that we can start to choose our response. And it doesn't mean you have to slow down. You know, I know physicians are so busy and they have to move at, move at high speed, but there's a way in which when we bring our full attention to the moment, that time does slow down and we start to see things clearly moment by moment. And then we have the freedom to choose our response. I loved something that you said at the retreat also, and I'm not going to get it quite right, but the idea is the presence and the joy and the presence when you're washing dishes. Do you remember that story? I really love that story. I can't repeat it correctly. <laughs> well, I think what I was sharing is that I, I don't like to cook or wash dishes. However, 
what I noticed is that as you bring your full attention to something, there's always something interesting. So for washing dishes, what I noticed is I got some really lovely dish soap that smelled like almonds. And I felt the warmth of the water and the smell of the dish soap. And what motivated me to try to be present while I was washing dishes instead of just letting my mind space out is this wonderful research study they did at Harvard that showed that if you are present, you are happier than if you are thinking about past or future, yeah. no matter what you're doing, whether you're commuting or washing dishes or stuck in traffic. And that was really fascinating to me. This was a study by Dr. Killingsworth at Harvard that that just being present actually makes me happier. And if happiness is my goal, which my guess is it's all of our goals, then all I need to do is bring my attention here to be fully present with whatever I'm doing. And I increase my odds of happiness. That's so simple. Also, one of the things I love <laughs> about what you share is you know, we make, I want to be happier and it's this complex project. And yet if all you have to do, um, what my business is actually called pause and presence. And I'm like, yeah, pause and be present and you can be happier. It's as simple as actually taking that time and enjoying it and noticing it. Absolutely. So I thought we could pivot to this idea of self-compassion. And for uh, many people in healthcare, we struggle with self-compassion. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, every person probably struggles with it to some degree. And um, I just love the way that you approach um, self-compassion as um, in a simple way. So simple practices. And there were two things that I thought would be valuable. One um, is this idea of mistakes and perceived mistakes. Um, and most of us in healthcare are trained that when we have a mistake or a perceived mistake, we go into shame, blame, and guilt. And that cascade of negative um, neurochemicals that make it hard to learn versus the self-compassion. And I have found that to be so valuable for um, particularly trainees who are learning, you know, they, they have a lot of ideas about perceived mistakes, which may not be mistakes, but mm -hmm. also people who, um, as part of their work, um, bad things happen <laughs> and yeah. people die. And we tend to go into shame, blame, and guilt. And it's very, very challenging. And so I would yeah. love for you to just share your thoughts about that in person, um, as opposed Absolutely. to my interpretation of what you say about them. <laughs> well, first of all, I completely agree with you that although all of us struggle with self-compassion, I've noticed that physicians in particular struggle with it. Yeah. And this is why I want to explain the science behind it, because I think physicians often, you know, I've worked a lot with physicians and have given a lot of talks to physicians. And whenever I get to the part about self-compassion, they kind of roll their eyes a little bit like, oh, here we go. And just, just give me the hardcore neuroscience and the practices to train my attention, right? The mental fitness totally makes sense to them. So like, okay, I buy into this, but that self-compassion stuff. So I want to, I want to explain the science. <laughs> so when you make a mistake and then after that mistake, you start judging and shaming yourself for it. What it does is it actually shuts down the learning centers of the brain and keeps you stuck in the very behavior and pattern that you're trying to change. So I'm not even telling you to be nice to yourself because it's nice. Right. <laughs> I'm telling you, be kind to yourself because it actually turns on the learning centers of the brain and will help you change. Okay. And this is really important. So when we shame and judge ourselves or other people, which in medicine happens a lot, right? In the training, yes. <laughs> it, it puts them into a stress response. It literally shuts down their ability to think and digest and sleep and do a lot of other important things. And it puts them really into survival mode. And this is not a state where we're able to learn. What's fascinating, I, I think so fascinating is that when you treat yourself with kindness, and I want to be really clear, kindness doesn't mean you lie to yourself, right? It's not like you did a great job when you messed up. <laughs> Your right. brain and nervous system aren't stupid. So the, the neurochemicals I'm going to tell you about in a moment, they're not going to get released if you're lying to yourself. So what <laughs> kindness means is being on your own team saying, darn, I really wish I hadn't made that mistake. How can I learn? 
-hmm. and knowing, right, trusting your pure intentions, right? You're, you're not trying to cause harm. So, so really feeling your good heart and approaching the situation with kindness that says, what can I learn? When I do that, it releases oxytocin, which is this right hormone of safety and love. And it releases dopamine. Kindness actually releases dopamine, which as I said before, is this neuromodulator of learning and motivation. So all of a sudden we create this chemical cocktail that helps us learn, helps us grow. And I want to be really clear, you know, our goal here isn't to be perfect. It, perfection is the antithesis of evolution, right? When you're, when you, you're perfect, you're done. Our goal is just to keep learning and growing. And actually self-compassion is really a, a superpower for helping with that. I will say that your phrase that um, perfection is the antithesis of evolution is super helpful for perfectionist physicians <laughs> because we all believe in evolution. And right. so, and we're all um, to some degree perfectionists because that's how we ended up getting where we got to. And so I think putting those together in the same sentence is absolutely yes. helpful for our brains to sort of accept this idea of self-compassion. The other thought that came to mind when you were talking is I often say um, we, uh, my version of not lying is I did the best I could in the moment with the information, resources, experience, skills, knowledge that I have, because you're right, mm -hmm. we never intend. So it's a long sentence, but it's very helpful because it sort of gets at all the pieces. So my brain knows it's 100% true. Yes, I appreciate that. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think for um, many people, I do um, coaching for quite a few fellows as well as attending physicians. And I think that you can just have that be one of your mantras. It's very helpful with about any decision making around patients or otherwise. Absolutely. The, the other thing that I want to say about self-compassion, because hopefully I've convinced a few people maybe to try it, is, is that the often when you try it, kind of like the mantra you just gave yeah. them, it feels a little forced or fake and a little uncomfortable. And so one of the tools that I use is I imagine, what would I say to my dear friend? Like, what would I say to Jesse if she made this mistake, right? So I take the exact same situation I'm in and I apply it to a dear friend and I imagine the words, the tone of voice I would use, and it really shifts my consciousness. Okay. So the, the kind of shortcut is what would I say to a dear friend that this had happened to? And I think um, that is one of the keys sort of getting out of our own stories and our own brain spinning. And of yes. course, that's how, what mindfulness helps you do. Um, and I think the other thing that I sometimes use is this idea of self-compassion is very stressful for people, but kindness is not. Every person in healthcare wants to be kind. And so exactly. to me, it's a bridge. Like, can you be kind to yourself and you'll get to self-compassion over time? Yeah, I love so that. I thought that was the perfect way to pivot over to the idea of good morning, I love you, because you talked about how uncomfortable it is to start. And <laughs> I think for many people that practice while simple and accessible is also um, very uncomfortable to start. Yes. Do you want to reflect on that and, and maybe tell people what the practice is too? Absolutely. So, and, and I'll, I'll just tell you the story of how I discovered it because I had that same response when, when I was going through a, a, a very painful divorce. Um, I was feeling a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of self-judgment and my meditation teacher suggested I start a practice of compassion for myself. And she said, I want you to say, I love you, Shauna, every day. And I was like, no way. Yeah. <laughs> it just sounded so contrived and inauthentic. And, you know, I was sitting there hating myself. I just, I, I just said, no, I can't do this. And she said, how about just saying good morning, Shauna? When you wake up, put your hand on your heart. And just offer yourself this kind of gesture of self-care. Just greet yourself like you would greet any other human being in the world. And I felt like, okay, that's that's fair. That's a good place to start. So the next morning, I put my hand on my heart. By the way, that releases oxytocin, so yeah. kind of helps you out. <laughs> Took a breath and said, good morning, Shauna. And it was kind of nice, right? Instead of the avalanche of shame and anxiety that I'd been used to waking up with, there was this flash of kindness, of, of presence. And as I continued to practice, I noticed a bit more 
softness, maybe a bit less judgment, a bit less harshness toward myself. And a few months later, I, um, it was my birthday actually. And I woke up, um, to do my good morning. I love, or sorry, my good morning practice. And I put my hand on my heart, took a breath. And this image of my grandmother came to me and my grandmother was my person. She helped raise me. I loved her and she had recently passed. And so this image of her came to me and I felt her love. And it was as if the dam around my heart burst and this kind of flood of love came pouring in from my grandmother, from my mother. And I felt my own self-love for really, I think the first time as an adult. And, you know, I wish I could tell you that every day since then has been this bubble of self-love and I've never felt shame or self-judgment again. And that's not true. (laughs) But what is true is this pathway of kindness toward myself had been established And I've continued to practice every day since then. And it has really shifted everything in my life. So I wish that I had a different practice to teach people because I get a lot of resistance to the good morning, I love you. And in fact, the title of my book, Good Morning, I Love You, you know, as a scientist, my publishers were like, can't we think of a more scientific title? But this practice has been so powerful. And now after my TED talk, you know, over three and a half, four million people know this practice. And so what I want to share is that it's okay for it to feel a little bit awkward. What we're doing is we're planting seeds of kindness. We're setting our intention toward kindness to treat ourselves with the same care, the same tenderness that we would treat anyone else. And so the key for this practice, and you can try it with me right now if you'd like, is to begin by just putting your hand on your heart and just notice that gesture of self-care, that gesture of kindness. And you don't even have to do anything more than that. Often I'll just wake up in the morning and put my hand on my heart. Take a breath and then you can try saying good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world right now. And then maybe try good morning, I love you and saying your own name and just see how it feels. Just be curious. Again, this isn't about perfect. It's just about practice. Good morning, I love you. Planting these seeds of kindness. Good. Love that. So I think that's the perfect place to um, pivot to your new children's book, which is planting the seeds of kindness at a much younger age. So we don't have to rewire our brain. Perhaps we can just wire them from the outset in a a way that this kind of practice would not feel abnormal. It would feel like brushing your teeth, checking in with yourself, connecting to your own heart. Do you want to, yeah. Do you want to share about this? Absolutely. So it's so interesting, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I work with people training them in these practices, teaching them about self-compassion, and it feels awkward to almost everyone. And What I think is this kind of incredibly unique opportunity is to teach these practices to our children when their brains are in a theta state, right? They're highly suggestible and trainable so that we can hardwire this in, just like we hardwire in language or brushing your teeth or riding a bike, that these neural pathways that get established in childhood, they stay with us, right? They're hardwired in and they're hard to change. So teaching our children to be on their own team, teaching our children about kindness at this early age is incredibly powerful and will give them resources for their entire life. Yeah, to me as a pediatrician, having this opportunity to share this, and I've already pre-ordered your book for all my nieces um, and maybe nephews, I haven't seen it yet. So I have to see it to figure out. I think it likely applies to everyone, but the, the name is female. So Um, but I think, you know, and I think also particularly, um, females tend to struggle with self-compassion and kindness a little bit more. I am the Mm -hmm. mom of three boys and I think you're the mom of a boy too, Mm -hmm. but we all need it. But I think the outward struggle is a little bit more potentially female, but I just love this idea of, um, getting children used to mindfulness and self-compassion. There's a lot of work on children and mindfulness, but I see very little work around children and self-compassion so far. So to have a simple thing like this, how amazing. 
It's actually, I have found very little on mindfulness and self-compassion. I mean, sorry, I've found very little with children and self-compassion. And what's interesting is we teach our children to be kind, you know, be kind to Susie or be kind to, you know, Joey, but we don't ever teach them to be kind to themselves. And it's kind of radical to actually teach our children to be kind to themselves. Yeah. And it's also so much easier, I think, if I'm thinking about world peace, which is an issue right now, to be kind. If we're kind to ourselves, it's also so much easier to be kind, not from a you have to or you're supposed to, but you want to be kind. Yes, Uh, because your heart is overflowing with kindness. As we plant these seeds of kindness in ourselves, they ripple out into the world. And what the research shows is just that, that people who practice self-compassion they are rated by their family, by their friends, by their coworkers as kinder, more generous, more present. So a lot of times I think people get worried that self-compassion is selfish or it's going to make me just focusing on myself. But you're right. As you train these muscles of kindness, they get stronger in all areas of your life. I loved um, that the research that you shared, that it makes you more generous and productive. And I think you even said it makes you exercise more, the self yes. And like, imagine that as a tool. Um, I'm back to thinking about people in healthcare, like as physicians, we sort of, um, and I, I say this with kindness and love, having practiced for over 20 years, you know, we sort of shame people into, well, what exercise are you doing and how much Rather than what if we taught people self-compassion and that led them to exercise more? Well, that's actually what the research shows. Kristen Neff, one of my dear friends and colleagues, has done numerous studies showing that when you train people in self-compassion and then you start them on an exercise or or healthy diet program, the people in the self-compassion training are much more effective and are able to follow through much longer. So You know, I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, I'll just become self-indulgent couch potato if I practice self-compassion. But in actuality, when you care for yourself, you take care of yourself. Yeah. And I think there's two points I want to make about that. One is that I have heard from physicians who I work with who start practicing self-compassion that when they show up as a self-compassionate physician, that seeps over to their patients and they become much more um, compassionate towards themselves. And then their patient outcomes improve. And yes. so this is really a tool to um, not only improve your own life, but improve others' lives as well. Exactly. And, then, and bringing yeah. it back to the children, I want to yeah. say that this book, the intention is also that their parents and their caregivers and their brothers and sisters that were really starting a movement of treating ourselves and each other with kindness. And that when you wake up each morning, right, my my hope is not just that they're reading the book, but we teach them the good morning, I love you practice, that that becomes something they practice on the way to school or at breakfast. And what I've, you know, from my first book for adults, good morning, I love you. They've sent me videos and and stories about how they've integrated it into their family. And that really was the impetus for writing this children's book is, is the power of something so simple. Yeah. And I think the power of something so simple at the beginning of your life or early on in your life, again, as opposed to having to unlearn these bad habits of thinking that we have to be mean to ourselves or push ourselves to accomplish things. And we're teaching the whole next generation that being kind to yourself actually is the most effective um, performance and productivity tool. Yeah, it's a superpower. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, you mentioned at the beginning about a fundraiser helping get to get these books into hospitals and healthcare settings and lots of other settings. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm very excited about this. So my hope is really that this book is accessible for all children um, everywhere. And so we've started a fundraiser um, to raise money so that we can donate books to children's hospitals, to family centers, to libraries, to schools, really focusing in underserved communities. And I'm delighted at the support we're receiving. And my hope, I, it's been so fun being able to find places to give away these books and to really support these communities. Because I do think, especially 
you know, when children are going through a hard time to imagine them coming into a waiting room at a doctor doctor's office and learn this practice of being kind to themselves, of being on their own team. So very excited about it. I love that. So I will put a link to the fundraiser in the show notes and also a link to help you all find um, the book so that you can, um, if you, by the time this podcast comes out, it will be out. So you can directly, it'll be the day before, or it will already be out. So you can order yourself one. And I encourage you to order one for all the children in your life that you connect with, because what a beautiful gift beyond it being a beautiful book, a beautiful gift to start them on a life of practicing some of these tools that it took, took me till I was almost 50 to learn these tools. I think that I first heard you speak I was 48 or 49. And so I was like, wow, no one's ever mentioned any of these things to me, you know, hand to heart and um, treating yourself with kindness in this way. Hmm. So I want to thank you so much for coming on and joining me. This was such a uh, delight. And so many of the things you shared are so, so relevant to um, the people that I work with and the whole healthcare community. Um, for the people working in it and the people that we care for. So I'm incredibly grateful for that. Would you want to share anything else as we close? Any messages? Mm, Absolutely. So first, thank you so much, Jesse. And what you just said, I think is really important that you didn't find these practices until you were 48. And what I want to share with everyone listening is that it's never too late. That one of the I think most hopeful messages of, you know, science in the last 400 years is really neuroplasticity, that our brain is growing and changing and evolving throughout our entire lives. Even into our 90s, we see neurogenesis. And so what I would say is it's never too late to begin again. We can begin again in any moment, no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter what our current life situation is. And it really begins with a single step. So I encourage everyone to begin or begin again. And thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please stay on after the singing bowl for a good morning. I love you mindful moment experience. If you would like to work on growing self-compassion in your own life, please reach out for coaching and or join me for a retreat. We do a lot of embodiment work around self-compassion and practice, which is what it takes to grow this. It's never too late and it takes practice. If you want to be able to model self-compassion for your children, I strongly encourage you to delve into this work yourself. Parent with Presence is also coming up soon, starting in mid-November. I offer this course once a year, and it is a great opportunity to explore tools to help you develop mindfulness and self-compassion, model it for your children, and also to teach your children tools. And so Dr. Shapiro's new book, Good Morning, I Love You, Violet, inspires me to um just remind people about Parent with Presence. And during that workshop and um, course, I offer lots of tools for teaching children mindfulness and self-compassion and lots of strategies for how to have a household that teaches children the value of these practices very early on. So I would love to have you join me for that. It's a small group program. It runs for Um, There are six sessions, 90 minutes each. You get uh, CME for it. It's accredited for CME. And if you have questions, please reach out. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us written reviews and stars. And please share it far and wide with those who you think might enjoy it. We'll see you next week. As always. If you want to declutter your mind, be more present, and start truly living your one wild and precious life, come find us at the mindfulhealerspodcast.com. Work with one of us. Work with both of us. Start or up-level your mindfulness practice. Discover how mindful coaching can change your life. Or even better, do both as part of our Mindful Healers programs and retreats. You can find links 
to find out more about our programs and join our communities at the Mindful Healers Podcast.com. Reach out and get started on your journey to a life better lived today. The content of this podcast is not meant to be medical or life advice. If you choose to participate in our mindful moments, please do so safely. Welcome to today's mindful moment. Today's moment is going to be a practice of good morning, I love you. Simple. Taking a moment to find your sit bones, tilting your pelvic bow forward and sitting up, stacking your spine with kindness and compassion, treating yourself well, reaching the crown of your head towards the sky because it feels good. And taking in a big breath of kindness towards yourself, kindness towards every cell in your body, filling each cell with breath and oxygen. And exhaling anything that gets in the way of letting that kindness percolate around. And bringing a hand to heart and the other hand to top, pressing the heel of your hand into your heart space, releasing oxytocin. Enjoying that feel-good hormone. Taking in another breath of kindness and self-compassion. Exhaling, releasing any judgment, meanness, thoughts about what you haven't done well. Once again, breathing in oxygen, kindness, nourishment. And exhaling, letting go of whatever would like to go. Taking a moment hand to heart here, noticing the cortisol in your saliva, envisioning it melting away, hand to hand, hand on hand, hand to heart. Taking a moment to appreciate this incredible neurochemical soup circulating around through your body. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, lovely, loving hormones. And taking a moment in your head to say hello to yourself. If it's morning, say good morning. If it's afternoon, say good afternoon. If it's evening, say good evening. And next, attempting the good morning, I love you. Good afternoon, I love you. Good night, I love you. Noticing if it feels uncomfortable and breathing into it. Just trying it, practicing it. It's never too late to learn something new. And then adding your name. Good morning, Jesse. I love you. Good morning, Yi Chang. I love you. Good afternoon, Jesse. I love you. Good night, Jesse. I love you. Noticing that when you add the name, how different it feels. Offering also that you could also say, Good morning, Jesse. Good afternoon, Jesse. Good night, Jesse. What would that feel like if you said good night or good afternoon or good morning with your own name? What does that feel like? Allowing yourself to get used to it, knowing anything that's unfamiliar is uncomfortable. But just because it's uncomfortable does not mean it's dangerous does not mean it's a problem, does not mean you shouldn't do it. It merely means it's unfamiliar. Coming back to the breath. Breathing in and breathing out. Hand on hand, hand on heart. Noticing how you feel. Enjoying it. Perhaps setting an intention here 
to practice a little bit more kindness towards yourself. 1% better, 5% better. It's never too late to learn. It's never too late to shift. It's never too late to practice mindfulness. It's never too late to practice self-compassion. It's a practice, it's not perfect. Coming back to your breath, noticing how you feel. Perhaps setting an intention to try this hand on hand, hand on heart practice going forward for a bit. Enjoying it and seeing with curiosity what might happen. Thank you all so much for practicing with me today. May you have a beautiful day filled with kindness, self-compassion, mindfulness, and love. See you next week.